Cambodia as I unravel the mystery of a civilization that for centuries most thought didn't exist. A place of rumor, myth, and legend. Hidden in the jungle for over 400 years, the discovery of Angkor Wat shocked the world. Its intricate majesty could only be the work of an advanced and sophisticated people. But where did they go? And why did they abandon all these temples to the jungle? To uncover the mystery of the lost Khmer Empire, I'll climb to the top of Cambodia's greatest temple. Learn the secrets of Bokator, its newly rediscovered lethal martial art. And take to the air to track down the reasons why this civilization disappeared into the mist of time. Reminds me of the good old days, flying hornets. <laughs> We're digging for the truth and going to extremes to do it. Hi, I'm Hunter Ellis. I've come to Cambodia to explore the mysteries that still surround a great civilization that existed here over 800 years ago, the Khmer Empire. Its capital, called Angkor, is long gone. But the temples built by this powerful civilization are some of the wonders of the world today. That's what I want to see. The Khmer Empire dominated Southeast Asia from 800 to 1432 AD. At its peak, the empire stretched from Vietnam to the Bay of Bengal and north to southwestern China. But despite its wealth and power, the Khmer Empire ultimately failed, its land and temples abandoned. I'm here to find out why. For this assignment, there's only one place to start, and I'm told only one person to start with. His name is Simon Warwick. He's among the world's leading experts in historic stone masonry. I'm told he's a tough man to track down. He's an Englishman who lives in Italy, who works with the Germans, who spends a bulk of his time here in Cambodia. Now, he told me to meet him at his office. Well, this is his office. Let's go see if we can track him down. Angkor Wat, Cambodia's most famous temple, is actually a huge complex. Just when you think you're approaching the main temple, you find out that you're only passing through an elaborate gate on the outer wall. This place is absolutely amazing. As you approach the front gate, that's all you can see. But then it opens up to all of this, the main temple, which is still 400 yards away. I'm told that Angkor Wat literally translates to city temple, as it used to be surrounded by an urban landscape that has long since disappeared. Simon works for the GACP, a German conservation project. Its mission is to save this Cambodian jewel from the ravages of time, weather, and human contact. I'm hoping that Simon can help me understand how such a masterpiece could be built and then abandoned. Angkor Wat is, in fact, the world's largest religious monument. That statement alone grabs your attention, but to see it is to believe it. The path leading ever upwards is a demanding journey, with stairways connecting different terraces on different levels. Finally, the center of the temple. It looks like I still have to head up there. Originally, it was a priest who would come up these steps. And they're definitely meant to be steep because they represent the difficulty of getting into the kingdom of heaven. Simon! Hi. Hey, how are you? I'm all right. Come on up. It's right through there? Through the door, and I'll meet you at the bottom of the scaffolding, okay? All right. Can you imagine coming this way to work every day? Hey, Simon. Hi, great to see you. I covered some serious ground to make it up here to you. Oh, yeah, but it was worth it. Oh, I cannot believe this is your office. Angkor Wat. The greatest religious monument in the world. The magnitude of this place is truly hard to grasp. Angkor Wat tops out at 213 feet, making it as high as Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. And it holds as much stone as the Great Pyramid of Khufu. And how long did all of this take? Well, that's what's so incredible. It only took 32 years to build. I think if we were to build something like this today, it would take us longer than 30 years. <laughs> no question. If you compare that with the buildings in Europe, like 
cathedrals, some of which are much smaller than this, they took three, four hundred years. So ten times the length of time it took to build all of this. Right, and there's a lot more stone here. You know, Simon tells me that it took 50,000 workers to build this extraordinary temple. It's surrounded by a four-mile moat and crowned by five huge towers. But size doesn't begin to measure the real power of Angkor Wat. Well, I've been coming here now since 1994. It's a long time. And, you know, every time I come in, I see something new, something different. It's so varied, so complicated, so... Virtually every surface in this temple is covered with exquisite carvings. Surprisingly, these stories come from a faith that originated in India, far across the sea. It's sophisticated, this carving. And they're telling stories from Hindu mythology up here. But how does the Hindu faith arrive in Southeast Asia? Because we're 2,000 miles away from India. Well, it turns out, the answer lies in the monsoon winds that carried seafaring Indian traders to the Mekong Delta. Marooned for months before they could ride the monsoons home again, they traveled upriver, passing their religion, art, and architecture onto the local people. The religious community were trying to communicate with people who couldn't read. So they put these images and the stories on the wall so that the people could understand it. What are some of the stories that are being told? Well, this is, this is very interesting. This is an uh, image that you'll find on religious buildings around the world. It's the Last Judgment. Now, I notice that some of these guys have their faces carved out or destroyed. Uh, this figure's particularly unpopular. He's the administrator who actually gives out the sentence. So he's the, the, the sort of prison guard who says, you're going to hell. It's not looking too pleasant down there. It's hell. There's 32 different types of hell as well. So is that a superstitious thing over the years that people have come in and destroyed the faces yeah. of the demons? That's the local people just saying, bad, bad, I don't like him, bad, bad. Simon tells me that these bas-relief carvings go on for more than half a mile. They're the longest continuous sculptures in the world. It's an awesome sight, but one that may not last. It starts and stops raining in a moment's notice around here, huh? Simon takes me on a precarious path to his current work site to show me the ongoing struggle to keep this civilization from disappearing again. So I just want to show you here, this is what happens if we get here too late. It's gone. Yeah, and when it's gone, all you've got is a rock. Here, we've lost the surface, we've just got geology. Here, we've got history. The carvings... The ravages intact. of time here have weakened lost. these carvings. So the history, they're now separating here, the from the foundation. How do you keep this from happening when it exists in an environment where it rains like this all the time? Actually, it rains some of the time, and the other time it's really, really hot and dry. So really the key word here is research. You've got to understand exactly why things are happening, and only then can you understand how to treat them properly. But when you have the biggest religious monument in the entire world, is your work ever going to be done? No chance. So what we've got to do is train the guys here to do it by themselves. I mean, this is their heritage. Their ancestors built it. They should be doing it. This is one of those places you never get tired of exploring, and that's good, because I still haven't cracked the core mystery. How did a people in the middle of the jungle build one of the greatest stone monuments on Earth? Few places on this planet inspire as much wonder as Cambodia's national treasure, Angkor Wat. But the more I see of it, the more questions I have. Not only did the ancient Khmer construct one of the largest stone buildings in the world, they did it without using any kind of mortar. How'd they pull that off? I'm hitting the road to find out. Just 20 miles northeast of Angkor Wat, I come to a place so important to the Khmer, they revered it as sacred. The majority of the Angkorian temples were built using a local sandstone. And huge blocks like this are all that remain of an old quarry that lies here at the foot of the Kulin Mountains. The sacred stone from the Kulin Mountains was used not only for the massive temple at Angkor Wat, but for literally hundreds of other Khmer temples across northern Cambodia. Imagine the manpower needed to cut blocks from these cliffs, drag them into place, and then build the astonishing temples we see today. How did they do it? It's essentially the same question that has puzzled Egypt.